<laughs> Welcome to another Taiki interview. Today we have Rhonda Parrish, author of Hollow and editor of many of Taiki's anthologies, including the newest one, Water, which is just came out in the middle of August. Hi, Rhonda. Hello. <laughs> Fancy meeting you here. Yeah. You know what? I'm going to go totally off topic first and ask about the tattoo uh, which, on your arm. This one? Yeah. It's, well, it doesn't really show well on camera because it's got Well, there's be... a quill. Maybe if I, hang on, let's see. No, if it's can... okay. We don't... <laughs> uh, there we go. Yeah. So there's a quill and ink. Quill. quill and a little raven. And an ink pot and then um, murder. Bird. Corvids. I'm not exactly sure what kind they are. Probably ravens or crows. <laughs> I asked the tattoo artist for, I wanted a whole bunch. I wanted a feather and I wanted a whole bunch of birds, but I didn't want that feather tattoo where the birds are coming out of the feather. Mm -hmm. the, the feather quill to represent writing and the birds to represent birds. <laughs> I'm going to get and, you to show it one more time because I didn't have you alone on the screen. Oh, I had a, oh, that's it. There you go. Perfect. Okay. And I know that was totally off topic, but I was Oh, no, I, I love my tattoos. I'm happy to talk about them anytime. <laughs> I've got this one, which, oh, I guess it's probably going to show backwards there. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Well, it might actually. No, no, it doesn't show backwards. It shouldn't show backwards. It shows backwards on your screen, but it doesn't show backwards when we put it uh, out. So it says fail better. And that's just a reminder to myself to not, I'm a bit of a perfectionist and I can become paralyzed if I just worry about getting everything perfect. So, you know, the quote, um, ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. <laughs> so I like, that's just a thing for what I need to, a reminder to actually just do the thing instead of panicking about making it perfect. <laughs> yeah well but what if it doesn't work or what if they don't like it and you know when you work in publishing that's that's a thing that you deal with all the time right yes <laughs> yeah you can't in especially in publishing there will always be something that gets through always <laughs> so I guess it's sort of my version of be brave just just do the thing well, that's a good motto to live by. Okay, now we will talk about the books. <laughs> Although I don't even know where to start. <laughs> well, there's so many of them. And you've got, um, like, Swashbuckling Cats came out earlier this, this year? Last year? Last year. Last year, earlier last year. I had to look at my calendar to find out. <laughs> <laughs> in April or, or April or May of last year and then next year you have the sequel coming out Pirating Pups. I'm super excited about that. We've got the submissions to that one open up in October and I cannot wait to dive into those because I love cats and we have cats but dogs are I'm like I'm definitely a dog person. Oh okay. <laughs> so I like I, I like dogs but I'm more of a cat person. I don't have a problem with dogs. I have a cat. Well, you can't see her, but she's sitting in the chair behind me. I have a couple just over here. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I, I love cats, but I really love dogs. <laughs> so but you I'm don't have cat. a dog? Um, we don't have a dog right now. No, we had one. We passed away and our, our cats were quite old. So we didn't want to like yeah, impose a puppy on them. No, and <laughs> but, that makes sense. Or even just an older dog. We just didn't want to disturb their environment too much. So, Yeah, they get pretty set in their ways when they get old. And they all have different health issues and they're all affected <laughs> by stress. And so... Yeah. Well, mine's 14 or 15 herself. So she's not young. All right. So, so then I have to get them like, like through, you know anthologies and through encountering pe people when they're walking their dogs in the street. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Okay, so let us start with, why don't we start with the elemental anthologies since the last one just came out. What was the impetus for the four elemental anthologies? Oh, it's been, it's been, it's been a while, you know, like I'm trying to think back to what precisely inspired it. And I'm not sure, but I can tell you, mm -hmm. I've been, I really wanted to work with Taiki books. So I pitched an anthology idea and Margaret said no. And I pitched another <laughs> anthology idea and Margaret said, eh, no. And I was like, I am wearing her down. <laughs> so then I pitched the elemental anthologies idea and she said, yes. And I was very happy. Um, I don't remember exactly like specifically where the idea for the, the series came from. But I do remember I started out, I knew I wanted to do all four elements and I had subtitles for earth and for fire. And we were like, so which one do we start with? Do we start with the fire? Do we start with the earth? Uh, and we did a poll and fire one by like two votes. <laughs> so that's, wow. that's why we started with fire. That's cool. And I know, I think there's only one or two authors that made it through all four of them. Yeah, there's not very many. Yeah, uh, I know Kevin Cockle did. And Chadwick Ginther did. Yeah, and I think that's about it. And Laura. Did Laura, Laura make it? Okay. I think it, that might be the only three. I'd have to grab a copy and look through the table of contents to remind myself. But. Yeah, it, it's not important. I just, so you have a wide range of authors. They're not all the same authors through all of them. Yeah, so. yeah. It's, you know, it's interesting. A couple of years ago, I didn't, I, when I read for the elemental anthologies, I didn't read blind, but I did a couple of anthologies a few years ago, including Equus. Uh, I read blind the submissions because I wanted to make sure that I wasn't sort of biasing anything by knowing the names of the people who were submitting to me or whatever, like without realizing it. And uh, there were a lot of familiar names on there too. So, so I think that there are people whose style I really liked or and who know what I like, so they <laughs> give it to me. <laughs> but I also think it's important to not you know, to have a diverse selection of people who are submitting and getting in. And, and so I, that's what I really love about open submissions is yes. that, you know, I've done, I do anthologies where it's invite only and because I have to, <laughs> because of the format of the anthology means that I have to have a set number of people and they have to know what they're writing beforehand. But I really prefer the ones where I get to read the submissions and let them guide how the anthology comes together because I might have an idea about how it's going to look when it's done. But then when I start reading the submissions, I'm like, oh, actually it's gonna have this feel, not this feel because that is what's in there and that's what's calling to me and that's what I'm really enjoying. So of the anthologies, and we'll get to Swashbuckling Cats in a minute, but of all of them, which one had the most submissions, would you say? Uh, water had a ridiculous number of submissions, like 420 or something. Wow. Um, actual, like, submitters. Mm -hmm. And it included poetry. And poetry you usually submit three to five, not just one. Yeah. So I didn't go through and individually count all of those to find out what the total number was. But um, I think 420 was the, the, it was definitely the most for the elemental anthologies. And how do you narrow something like that down? Slowly. <laughs> I, <clears throat> I ended up with a very large shortlist for water. Um, and it was, it was really hard to cut it down to a table of contents. Um, really hard. But, you know, I've been reading, I read submissions a lot because I do a lot of anthologies. And before I did anthologies, I did Nightblade magazine. And so for that one, I was reading pretty much constantly. So I usually I can tell before I finish a story, whether it's gonna be going on the short list or not, <clears throat> at least. Uh -huh. uh, so I don't necessarily read all submissions all the way to the end before they go on the short list or not. But once they get on the short list, then I have to reread everything and 
and take notes and figure out which ones go best with which ones because sometimes you have to get rid of really good stories because they just don't fit all the other ones on the like the short list that are going to make the table of contents so it's a tough balancing act for the authors because they need to stand out but they can't be so different that they can't play well with others and by yeah. they i mean the stories not the author yeah no i knew that um okay so let's go on to um swashbuckling cat um which is over here <laughs> if you can see it with my virtual hand anyways yeah um so i i you have the story behind that in in your introduction and how it started <laughs> off as a a tweet between you and margaret and sandra and plus and krista too yeah yeah krista too it's sort of a tweet thread um and i have no idea where i'm going with this question <laughs> <laughs> i think it's actually really fun a lot of publishing you you know you get into a routine and you you're doing the same thing over and over again in slightly different ways i think it's super fun that a joke on twitter turned into an anthology which then got nominated for aurora like yes. i just that cycle of events is just so fun to me and there's even a story in it that was nominated for an aurora too. there is chadwick ginther's story was nominated as yeah. well and we can't say if they won it yet because as we're recording this they haven't been announced <laughs> that's right it was you know the thing about <coughs> excuse me thing about swashbuckling cats coming out last year um is that last year was really really hard and hollow also came out last year right as the pandemic started and i was like i don't know how to encourage people to check this book out because hollow was quite dark and march of 2020 was quite dark <laughs> and i was like i don't know how many people are going to really want to like dive into the darkness when they're surrounded by darkness um but swashbuckling cats it's also kind of dark but in a different way and there's cats with swords and ships and it you know it's not it's not cheery comfort read but it's fun in a way that I think a lot of people really needed last year yeah well and this year too yes. actually <laughs> So the, the timing on that is unfortunate because putting out any book during a pandemic is, is difficult, but also it worked out really well. There was a lot of serendipity going on with this book. Okay, um, since you mentioned it, that will lead us into Hollow, which is just beneath Swashbuckling, swashbuckling Cats. <laughs> um, <okay. laughs> Hollow is a standalone novel. It's not an anthology that you edited. It's your own um, YA. Although, like most YAs, I read it. And I'm not. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, give us a brief non-spoiler overview of it. It's also been nominated for an Aurora. It has. So you've I'm... got two Aurora nominations on just out of Taiki stuff for this year. Yeah, yeah, I've got three on the ballot this year, which is yeah. awesome because I've I've never actually been on the ballot before. So I have a little pin too. I've been nominated. Nice. So, but um, uh, so Hollow, give it, yeah, non-spoiler well, version. A teenage girl. She's got a lot going on in her life already, as most teenage girls do. She's dealing with with bullies and family stuff and. On top of that, when she, she finds a camera in a, the haunted hospital that's across the street from her house and she takes some pictures with it and things just go from bad to worse, um, I think pretty much sums it up. It's a, we had a, a difficult time classifying it, but in the end we decided to call it a YA paranormal thriller and it's, I, I really love it. <laughs> I'm totally biased obviously because I wrote it, but you know, you write things 
and you're you're proud of them, and then you write the other things, and you're like, I really love this thing, and hollow falls into the I really love this thing category for me. Do you love it enough to write another? <laughs> well, yes and no. <laughs> um, Not I, necessarily a sequel per se, but another book. I'm I'm thinking absolutely. I I mean I've written some other books since then, but they aren't related to Hollow at all. Um, but of the same genre. Sort of a prequel idea for Hollow. The thing about Hollow, without being too um, spoilery, is that it is it's like an allegory written up in story, right? It's, it's yeah. Like, oh no, it's definitely standalone. That's why I didn't say necessarily a sequel, but of that genre maybe is more what I was thinking. Yeah, but I what I mean is it's it's sort of um, well how I intended it. It's sort of. I don't know how to explain this without being spoilery. It's kind of about moving through trauma, mm -hmm. um, but with a lot of paranormal stuff going on. Yeah. So <clears throat> I, I have ideas for a prequel, but they're kind of tricky to write because I would want them to have the same sort of bones not about the mm -hmm. same issues obviously but the same sort of bones with the the paranormal and the, the stuff on added to that as well and uh right now it's it's a tough time for me to go to that part of my brain because I'm dealing with so much stuff that you know in the world as we all yeah. are and I'm just like I I don't want to I don't want to live there and you have to live there for a while when you're writing the book right so I'm just I kind of dip in and I get a bit of an idea and I, I you know, make a little post-it note somewhere and then tuck it away again. And I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to you in a little while. You, you just have to sit there for now. So if you do a prequel, because you've obviously thought of it, is it the same family or is it just a, a different one with, say, the camera or the hospital or same world well, basically but not the same family it wouldn't be the same family what i'm looking at is sort of the same um same world i don't think it's spoilery to say that the camera is cursed so it would be the same since it says it on the back cover it does it okay good <laughs> okay so it wouldn't be it wouldn't be the same family but it would be the same sort of curse and then you know finding out more about how that works and where that came from <clears throat> so sort of working backward to discover the stuff that happened in Hollow. yeah because it's a, a polaroid type camera isn't it yeah yeah as i recall i was trying to remember so you can't go too far back <laughs> <laughs> well or can i i suppose you can it can jump <clears throat> vessels i suppose <laughs> Um, I, I, yeah, again, I, I don't know too many of the details yet because I'm not, I'm not there in my head yet, but it's, it's looking like maybe 80s. We'll see. So I'll be going back a little while. Okay. And, um, and I had spoken to you this in, about this in the emails. Every one of your um, um, dedications, that's the word, <laughs> is to Joe which is really sweet because I know Joe is your husband after I asked you what the heck is, who the heck is Joe? <laughs> and I, as someone who is all but worships her own husband, I can understand that. But still, you get to go into a description. Uh, <laughs> why always for Joe, not for anyone else in your immediate circle? I, I wouldn't be who I am without Joe. And I wouldn't be able to do what I do without Joe. Yeah. Uh, oh, you're going to make me all weepy. <laughs> he, I warned he, you that I would ask. This. You did. I just, I didn't know I was going to get all emotional about this. <laughs> um, I think maybe one story that kind of sums it up is a few, and by a few, I mean probably 20 years now, because time is weird. 20 years ago, I was like, I need a new job. I can't do what I'm doing anymore. I, I need to do something different. 
And he said, well, if you could do anything in the world, what would you do? And I said, I would write, but that's not going to happen. And he said, well, why not? <laughs> and I was like, well, and every reason I came up with, he was like, yeah, but like, like, you just got to try, <laughs> you know, you never know unless you try. And so that year for Christmas, I wanted an ISBN. That was like, that was my goal. <laughs> I, you know, I, I'd written lots. I just hadn't published anything book length or whatever. Um, so looking back to a time when all I wanted for Christmas was a book deal to now where I've got, you know, an ego shelf full of books and I couldn't have done any of it without him. I think dedicating the books to him is the absolute least I can do to recognize that. I can totally relate. We have a similar story with my husband. I was having health issues, so I had to quit a very high paying job in finance to go work for Margaret, you know, and without my husband's support. Yeah, people ask me, you know, how can you, because working full time in publishing is really, really hard to make ends meet. Yeah. People say, how can you do that? Like, how do you, how do you do that? How do I do that? And I'm, I don't think I could do that if I didn't have my husband having a good job. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Even just, you know, the emotional support and the the belief and the faith and all of that is the core thing. But then when you get into the practical stuff, I wouldn't have the time to write as much as I do or edit as much as I do or have my own office and like you know, you need the roof over your head and you need the food in your belly and you need the time to be able to do the thing. And when I was writing while I had a different full-time job, fitting it in, you know, five minutes while I'm waiting for my daughter to get out of ballet and 10 minutes while she's playing at the park, it, it, does, it doesn't come together in the same sort of way as when you, like, you've got an eight hour chunk where you yeah. can do the thing that you need to do. So what else does Rhonda Parrish do when she's not editing and writing? <laughs> uh, I play a lot of video games. What are you these, playing lately? Uh, these days I'm actually in between video games. I was playing a lot of Divinity 2. And then when the pandemic hit, I was like playing Stardew Valley because I was all about the wholesome, like, oh yeah, immersing myself in that. Right now I'm only playing Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder. Okay. I noticed the new one came out. I haven't got it yet because I'm playing. Well, I set myself a goal at the beginning of the year to replay all the Yakuza games and get 100%. And I've played seven of them. I, I haven't redone Like a Dragon yet. And I've taken a break and I'm now playing Code Vein. Because <laughs> it's, it's hundreds and hundreds of hours when you decide to do that. Plus, they're very emotionally roller coasters. They are. Mm. If you play yeah. ever play Yakuza Zero, be prepared to like choke up at the very least. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'll probably pass on that one. Uh, but, um, you know, a couple of years I actually set one of my goals to be um, to finish Divinity Two. Mm -hmm. Like one of my professional goals was to finish Divinity Two, and it was it made sense to me because I needed to schedule some time that wasn't work time. I needed to feel like this needed to be yeah. a priority and a goal and just writing down, I'm going to finish this <laughs> video game, which is hundreds of hours. Yeah, no, and I've like, played it. <laughs> I like, like, it just, it made it okay for my workaholic self to be like, no, I'm, I'm actually going to take a day off and go do something that has nothing to do with work and go, go play this video game because my brain needs to a break. <laughs> Well, that's what my husband and I do, like right after dinner, most people watch TV, we'll put an hour into video gaming, and then an hour of TV and then go to bed. Because... We, used to, uh, we used to play World of Warcraft, and so after dinner was World of Warcraft time, but that consumed my life because I do <laughs> things in moderation. <laughs> so uh, these days, if we're not playing video games after dinner, I usually 
crochet. Um, we just watch television and I, I crochet, keep my fingers busy. Weekends, I like to, to do quilting or the tabletop role play games. Um, I also really like photography, but I haven't been doing a whole lot of that right now because I, I just, I hurt myself a while ago and I wasn't able to really go very far from the house. And I'm like, how many times can I photograph the same things that I live with? <laughs> so so that, that hasn't been happening a whole lot, but a lot of crafty stuff and a lot of tabletop role play. Do you do that online with friends? I do use uh, Roll20, which is really nice. And then See, Roll20 and my computer never got along. It, I would always it would always crash my system because we play tabletop video games too. Um, and we, we did a D and D session with a bunch of friends and then a GURP session with a couple of friends. And I, it all, I'd always end up rebooting once throughout Ro roll 20 and we could never figure out why. Oh, wow, that's not yeah. at all. So we're in the process of looking for something else. We had started when the numbers were down, we had one friend over and we were doing a GURPS thing, but A, the numbers have gone back up, so we're not mm -hmm. doing that. And B, he moved to BC, so he can't do that anyways. <laughs> yeah, I was really looking forward to being able to meet with my, well, one of my groups in person again, um, but then the numbers started going up. But yeah, with the pandemic and us moving to being online, we started having people in our group who were from other countries and who couldn't meet in person even if we wanted to so you know that was a, a bit of a silver lining I guess yeah but Roll 20 works for me so I, I had that going yeah we also have a wall of um tabletop games non-role play we've got like over 200 games so we'd have people over almost every weekend but haven't done that in a long time too yeah, it's it's hard these these changes we made. You know, I keep trying to focus on the on the silver linings that I found. Like the past month, I went to three different conventions, uh, and I didn't have to leave my office. You know, <laughs> that was very nice. But yeah, it's it's really hard, and it's especially hard when you don't necessarily see the the like the light at the end of the tunnel. No. Yeah. <laughs> so it's. I'm definitely looking for joy where I can find it. And that's one of the reasons why I'm writing things that are lighter than hollow now. Sometimes you want to read darkness. Like when the pandemic first started, like Mad Max, everybody was watching Mad Max because they want the, you know, that when you immerse yourself in the darkness, that's actually cathartic sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever you're living in isn't as bad as that. And sometimes I really enjoy reading that even now so books like like hollow or mad max movie or horror stuff and mm -hmm. i i really enjoy reading that still but i i can't get into the the space of writing that in great chunks anymore because i need to find yeah it's a very different headspace writing than reading yeah and i need to find that like relief mm -hmm. these days what I do, and I did this before the pandemic, is I have a bunch of online friends. So I'll pick a really, really bad B horror movie. Like you expect it to be bad. And then you watch it and then you type your comments <laughs> to each other to, about it online, it's basically like lampooning it. Every once in a while, you come up with some decent ones. But um, like the last one I watched, though, which wasn't decent, was. Um, Wally's World with Nicolas Cage. That was a really bad horror movie. <laughs> Trust me. But those are fun. You know, they're they don't they're not darkness. They're really not when you watch it that way. I don't mind consuming dark stuff and and uh you know, yeah. I enjoy that, but I, I can't live in there for novel length stuff. I'm writing some dark short stories. <laughs> but not but not novels and actually speaking of short stories I did notice because I just got got it to to format it um, yesterday you've got a short story in our upcoming holiday anthology too I do I love it it's it's good dogs it's I mean dogs, it has right? to because right? of the theme <laughs> of the anthology but <laughs> 
Yes. Like I mentioned, I'm a bit of a dog person. Oh, I don't know if the table of contents has been announced yet. So um, don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I think it has. I've definitely got the credit listed on my webpage. So I've already spoiled it if it's a spoiler. <laughs> It doesn't really matter. This isn't going out for, well, maybe next week. We'll see how long it takes me to put holidays together. I, I wrote a, um, a Norse mythology inspired urban fantasy called One in the Hand that was included in a uh, Taiki Books uh, box set. I think it's still available. The, it's Myth and Magic, something like that. Um. Oh, Magic and Mysteries? Is that the one? Is that what it's called? Yeah, okay. It's got a woman with a sword on the cover. Um, oh, I hope you cut this part out. <laughs> no, I'm not. I don't cut out anything. Hey. Yes, it's the sword on the cover. Magic and Mystery. Magic and Mystery. Okay. So I wrote um, yeah. a novel, One in the Hand, which is Norse, myth Norse mythology inspired, and it's in that box set. And in it, the, the main character's name is Autumn, and she has two dogs. And I love the dogs in that book, and they, they maybe got a little bit more page time than they deserved. But when I learned about the call for submissions for the Home for the Holidays anthology, I was like, I know the perfect dogs. <laughs> and uh, so I wrote sort of, it's a, uh, sort of a bridge story from One in the Hand to the next novel that is in Home for the Holidays, which is called, oh my goodness, what is it called? It's, it's a funny name, it's like. Give uh, me two seconds and I can pull it up because like I said, I was working on it actually just today. I know the bracketed part. It's called Two Loyal Dogs Bracket and a home, Horn Head in an Apple Tree. That's right. <laughs> Titles are not my forte. But, or I guess you should have to write it, two loyal dogs and a horned head and an apple tree. There you go. I wasn't about to sing it. I'm glad you did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, people everywhere are cringing. Now. <laughs> <laughs> so that was super fun because, again, it, it's kind of dark. It's kind of not. I get to be a little bit goofy with the title. Can you give a spoil a non spoilery outline of the story? If you can't, that's fine. Um, I think I can. So when Autumn is walking her dogs in the park, a mysterious figure appears and demands that she gives her an apple. Um, and when she refuses, the figure disappears and takes one of her dogs with her. And so Autumn has to go and and recover her dog. Well, that's not very nice. Well, it was, it's sort it, it's a little more complicated than that. But oh, I know, I'm nice. sure it makes sense in the story. And Autumn did not take it well when her dog was missing. Who would? I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'd be kicking some butt too. So what's next for Rhonda Parrish? Oh, I like, like how I'm talking to you as a third person. Uh, <laughs> What's next for you? For Taiki related stuff, we have the Pirating Pups submissions open in October, and that book will be coming out next year. And then the Women in the Sea is opening for submissions in 2022. Is that a Taiki one too? Pardon me? That's not, a, is that a Taiki one too? That one's Taiki too. I didn't know that. So look at that. It's <laughs> far in the future. So. I mean, I had to look at my whiteboard to see even when the submissions were, but yeah, submissions are next year, and then it'll be coming out the year after that. And what about, you don't have to just um, be Taiki. What else do you have come out? <laughs> uh, I had an anthology come out this week called Dark Waters, which is sort of the darker horror version of water, selfie sirens, and sea monsters. It's all about the, the scary things that lurk in the deep. Um, next month, I have another anthology called Geos for Ghosts coming out, which is 26 different ghost-inspired stories, one for every one of the alphabet, which I'm super excited about because it's coming out right around Halloween when 
you know, you can't get enough ghost stories. And you, you like the ghost stories because you did the, the walk, the, the, the city. Yeah, I did through. Erie Edmonton and yeah. uh, with Rona and I did um, Haunted Hospitals with Mark Leslie. Yeah. So you yeah, tend to like the, the, the spooky. I do. I do. <laughs> I really like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm skeptical when it comes to ghost stories in real life, but I really love the fiction of them. So I am willing to completely suspend that skeptical disbelief and immerse myself in the, the story and just love it. I can understand. I'm the same way. <laughs> I don't actually believe in ghosts until I finally see one, but it's fun to <laughs> it's fun to watch and read about them. I do all that. Mm -hmm. I even like to watch the so-called real life ones. <laughs> I mean Obviously, I don't think they're real, but they're still because they have that little spooky element in them, even if they're right. just, you know, so I like to watch them. They're just more fun than anything. <laughs> I watched a lot of them when we were working on Unhaunted Hospitals, not for, for research material per se, but to see the places I was writing about because they would be there and filming and going through in a three dimensional way. So mm -hmm. um, it helped sort of color what I was reading in my other research uh and they drove me crazy <laughs> look there's probably a ghost here because look the hair is on my head or, like, or there's a breeze <laughs> could you just show me <laughs> the hallway that's what exactly. I want to see yeah no it's always fun <laughs> yeah I don't watch the I don't know what's the one where they bring in the mediums and stuff I don't watch those ones just because those are just too silly but <laughs> you know there was a, a thing when I was working on haunted hospitals there was the spookiest thing the thing that came closest to convincing me that ghosts exist was actually an outtake of one of those reality shows it was like a five second clip that somebody just like and also this interesting thing happened and I was like that is the thing that might convince me that goes are real and you're just throwing it into the outtake but they'd set up a camera in a hallway of a hospital and it was pointing down the hallway and a few feet in front of it there was a door with a glass window in it you know like how hospitals have the big mm -hmm. glass windows um and it was dark. So the glass window was like a mirror reflecting mm -hmm. the camera back. So you could see the, the light, the red light from the camera showing that it was recording in the, win the window there. And something moved in front of the camera and it didn't move like a person and it didn't move in any way that I could say, oh, that was, uh, yeah. it was, it moved in a way that was foreign to my experience. And it was physically there because the camera shifted to try and focus on it. But it did not break the light of the red light. Oh, okay. So it was there enough for the camera to sense it and try and focus on it. But it wasn't there enough to block the red light on the that was reflected in the mirror. The, yeah. In the window. window. Yeah. And I was like, that is your story. That is the thing that you <laughs> make your whole show about. You don't tuck that five seconds into the back with the outtakes. That's the thing. <laughs> oh, I guess, you know, you never stop editing, right? No, <laughs> I suppose that's true. When it's like, no, why did you cut that? <laughs> you should have cut the part with the ball rolling. Balls roll. Right, that's what they do. <laughs> Because I don't, I th don't think I've ever met a completely flat floor. So <laughs> balls roll. You may think they're flat, but the thing when they roll from off screen onto the screen, and you're supposed to go, "Ooh, oh my goodness!" Like, Nobody wow, pushed that off screen. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Nobody pushed that at all. <laughs> um. But, you know, despite my derision, I do love ghost stories. I'm the same way, so I can't complain about that. 
So is there anything else you want to discuss and whatnot before we start going to pluggables? Um, We've been at it about 40 minutes, well, 35 minutes, I guess. I'm looking at my whiteboard to see if there's anything on there that's... It doesn't even have to be business related. What's your favorite cause? <laughs> oh, <laughs> my favorite cause. Every year I do a blog tour uh, fundraiser for the Edmonton Food Bank because I think it's important. Obviously, food is important for substance, sustenance, but it's also important to for so many other reasons, right? Especially around the holidays, food is tied into all sorts of holiday things. So um, every year I do a fundraiser for the food bank. We call it the Giftmas fundraiser, and I'll be doing that again this year. I also really like to support um, Save the Chimps and Oh my goodness, I can't remember the name now. I give them money every year. Anyway, for, uh, for chimpanzee rescues. Send me a link in, and I'll add it to the notes on the YouTube there's page. There's one in Quebec. Uh, well, you didn't have to do it right this second. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to remember what it was called. Oh, you had like, sanctuary. That's it. I'm sorry, what was that again? Fauna sanctuary. My memory is so bad. You have a clicky clack keyboard too. Those are the oh, best. I love it. Except well, I, it's for gaming. I find they're the best. My uh, my bedroom is right through that wall, and sometimes I can't sleep, and my husband can. So when insomnia strikes and I'm in here trying to do stuff, I'm like <laughs> typing as quietly as possible. It's quite pathetic. <laughs> He's like, we need to get you a nighttime keyboard. <laughs> so, but when, yeah, when we were buying this, when we were in the store back when that was a thing, which I did, they, I was like trying all the keyboards to find out which one had exactly the right sound and feel because you know, yeah, we I spend a lot of time on them. It matters. Well, I prefer mechanical keyboards too. They're, I find, especially when you're gaming, because we're PC gamers, we're not console gamers. I, I prefer just feel in the clickediness. Yeah, I and I, I love the, the feedback. It feels like when I'm writing, it feels productive, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, look how fast I'm going. I'm like an old time these typewriter. <laughs> these words are probably crap, but <laughs> I am writing them fast. <laughs> you can hear it. Yes. Okay, so if people want to stalk you, where's the best place? Give me pluggables. Uh, RondaParish.com. I've got most of the things linked from there. Uh, also my Patreon, which if you just throw Rhonda Parish into the search, it should pop me up. You can also, like I said, send me any links you want to put me to put in the notes on the YouTube page. I could do that. I will do that. Those are the two main places. I'm also on Twitter a lot, but less these days twitter can be a time suck i sort of gave that up and for a while i had the big idea oh i'll also contribute into tightees and that lasted maybe a month <laughs> <laughs> i uh i dip in and out but like i didn't mean to curate my feed to be all COVID all the time but that's kind of what it's turned into and i i can i can only deal with that in small doses and I understand that that is a huge privilege that I have, but I am exercising it <laughs> because, <laughs> because I need to. No, why not? Okay, well, any last words? No. <laughs> Can I book? put the stuff that we did before recording as an outtake? Do I have your permission? <laughs> Uh, that's fine. Yeah. Our wiggles and all. <laughs> <laughs> People will figure out what that means if they watch the whole video. That's right. <laughs> I and mean, if you're this far, you might as well just wait for the the end. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again for doing this interview. 
And while this will come out after, we will see you again tomorrow for the um, launch of water. <laughs> That's great. That's exciting too. Well, maybe I can get my audio right in one try for that one. We'll see. <laughs> Just keep what you've got here. Don't change it. Don't move anything. And we'll be fine. <laughs> All right, that's the plan. I just, I won't change anything. Okay. <laughs> Thanks again, Rhonda. Thank you for having me. She says and then wiggles in her chair. Okay. Welcome to another. <laughs> <laughs> Wiggle cam makes everything more exciting, right? That's what they do in like crime shows. I should leave all this on in front just <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.